On what grounds do we wrestle with the divine? Where can we wrestle with God? Or put it in non-religious terms, it seems apparent that there is more to this universe than pure material. After all, where in the universe can I find an idea like love? Love, the idea, exists as something metaphysical. Where are these metaphysical things which we humans must contend? Two painters, friends, tried to tackle this in 1888 with two separate but similar paintings. The first is Vision After a Sermon by Paul Gauguin. If you have any familiarity with the Bible, then you probably know about the strange tale of Jacob wrestling with an angel of God. Obviously, Gauguin is wondering the same question as he returns from a sermon and makes this painting in the summer of 1888. The second painting seemingly shares no relationship to the first. It has no sign of mythic tale of a man wrestling with a spiritual being. The only similarity is compositional. A bending tree arches from the lower right to the top left of both paintings. This is one of Vincent van Gogh's sower paintings. Van Gogh himself wrote of what he was doing. Unsatisfied by his friend's answer to the question, van Gogh made this painting as a sort of rebuttal. In their book, Modern Art and the Life of a Culture, Jonathan Anderson and William Dearness make this observation. Gauguin's tree serves as a means to distinguish between the tangible, factual here of the congregants and the intangible, visionary, elsewhere of the biblical subject matter. Van Gogh accepts this division, but radically revises its logic. He places the biblical figure, the messianic sower, in the foreground on the left side of the tree, concretely on our side. And in fact, the sower moves towards us as though the field on which we stand is also the object of his labor. The revelatory vision of God confronting us happens in the foreground rather than in the distance and in the guise of a working peasant rather than an angel. Van Gogh is thinking through the logic of incarnation here. He retains this elsewhere of the space beyond the tree, but he renders the distance as eschatological rather than only metaphysical or imaginative. In the far distance appears the house of the farmer to whom the harvested wheat will eventually be brought in. Taking a closer look at Kogan, let's see if we can see what Anderson and Dearness are getting at. This painting is all foreground and background, with no middle ground. Lining the bottom left of the image are diligent Dutch peasants, mostly women, praying and watching. In the strange background red space, two figures in ancient garb are engaged mid-wrestle. The tree separates the peasants and their present from the past. On top of that, there is something special about the red ground. What do I mean by ground? It certainly doesn't look like dirt. In painting terms, there is often a color laid down on the canvas before a painting begins. This is often called the ground. This underlaying color sets the stage for all of the other colors to be built up. The ground permeates and affects all the colors that stand atop it. This ground is not only an abstract representation that flattens space, it is also an element that contrasts the subjects by popping forward in all the negative space. This is also a special sort of ground. Most paintings don't use red, but one type of painting does. Specifically, the iconography that is found in Catholic and Orthodox churches. An icon, properly made, uses a red ground upon which gold leaf is gilded. It is this sort of ground that can hold the pure heavenly gold that cuts through space and time, often in the form of halos. This is what the gold signifies in most icons. In this visual theology, the pious pray and contemplate that red heavenly ground from a distance. Only one woman seems to even observe the actual wrestling. Many commenters have likened this to the mysteries of the Catholic theology and liturgy, which Gauguin observed but never joined. Vincent makes a very different painting. The tree is similar, but the spectators are gone. The red is replaced with vibrant yellow, and the figure does not look up to some heavenly parable, but rather looks down to the ground where he sows seeds as he marches towards the viewer. How can this painting be theological when it is merely mundane? Van Gogh was a Protestant surrounded by hardworking Dutch peasants. He believed that work can be more than just physical. If God came down and called himself a sower, then it must be through sowing that we can wrestle with him. The ultimate ground that Van Gogh is pointing to is the human heart. Van Gogh claims that we contend with the Lord when we diligently sow seeds, 
like the parable Christ once told. We are to sow and reap what we can. It is in this faithfulness that our struggle occurs. In his book, The Benedict Option, Rob Durer points out, opportunity to work is a gift from God that, when rightly employed, serves life and draws us back to him. However, if work, family, community, school, politics, or any other good thing becomes an end in itself, it turns into an idol. It will eventually become a prison, a desert, even a graveyard of the spirit. These things serve the truth and human flourishing only if they are icons through which the light of Christ shines forth, making them a means by which the kingdom of God flourishes. In the end, both paintings are hinting at what it means for most of us to wrestle with the divine. We wrestle with the divine in our thoughts, and our emotions. Whether or not you believe in a divine being like the God of the Bible doesn't much matter in my view. We all have ideals that we fail to live up to. We must all wrestle and contend to be better. Where do we do that? In thought or in the day-to-day? -day? Gauguin leans on the head knowledge. See how most of his audience do not even have bodies included? Van Gogh, with his tormented heart that will soon have a bullet lodged nearby, thinks that if the heart is in the right place, then perhaps the sun will set behind our head, making a sort of halo for it to rest. But we are alone. There is no congregation of pious worshippers beside us. There is just the work through which we toil alone. I don't know why, but I cannot find many commentators discussing the tree. In the context of Christianity, which both paintings are intentionally referencing, it can be seen as the cross. I wonder if it is a reference to the bending dome of heaven above us. The ideas, the forms, the heavens, whatever you might call them, they do stretch out over our heads, but they also touch us here below and are rooted in the same soil where we plant our seeds and where we bend our knees. The first places of worship were holy groves on high mountains. Christian cathedrals reference these canopies through their architecture. Our ancestors rested from danger by climbing trees. Swinging your feet from a tree branch, you can plan the work the next day and dream of the heavens. We must learn to look both down and up with our hearts and with our minds. I think I need both paintings to wrestle with that transcendent mystery. I think that it is why I make physical art that reaches upwards towards towering concepts. You need to find that place where you can do both or be warned, as Durer says, you will begin to worship one over the other. I would like to thank Jonathan Anderson, William Dearness, and Rob Durer for the works referenced in this video. If you haven't read Modern Art and the Life of a Culture or The Benedict Option, I highly recommend both books.